The Kalamazoo Community COVID-19 Update is produced locally through Public Media Network. Hello and welcome to the Kalamazoo Community COVID-19 Update. My name is Clifford Brown and I am your host. Today we are really truly uh, pleased to have one of uh, not only someone that's well uh, accomplished in her career, but also a friend of mine. Um, we'd like to welcome you, Dr. Janet Hahn. How are you, Janet? Dr. Dr. Uh, Hahn. I'm very good, thank you. How are you today? I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, I, I talked earlier to, uh, to our production manager and I said, you know, the other, other shows have been uh, not too difficult. But because I'm, I'm working with a friend of mine, this, this may be kind of tough. Well, well let's hope it's easier. <laughs> okay. Well, if you would, uh, Dr. Hahn is not only a Kal Kalamazoo native, but also comes with a, a, just a plethora of accomplishments. And I'd like to go through, of them, go through some of them because I want our audience to know exactly who they're hearing today, okay? First and foremost, you uh, have your PhD in F-A-G-H-E-C-P-G. Now, <laughs> I, I looked at that. As a matter of fact, I took a bit of time to, uh, to Google it. You know, the kids these days say, well, I Googled it. I did that. I didn't come up with much. Before our viewing, viewing audience, uh, give us a little history on that. Tell us what that means. Okay, well, my PhD is actually in sociology. A lot of us with PhDs, we don't put the subject matter behind our name, but uh, my training really is in the study of groups and how groups affect our experience of life. Um, but F-A-G-H-E is a fellow of the Academy of, for Gerontology and Higher Education. So I'm an experienced educator in gerontology, which is the study of aging and um, CPG is a certified professional gerontologist. So I have uh, done enough training and have enough experience to be considered an expert in gerontology. Oh, wonderful. Okay. And, and likewise, you are a contract assistant professor for the School of Interdisciplinary uh, Health and Programs at Western Michigan University, correct? Yes, I am. Yes. All right. I, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I coordinate our healthcare services and sciences program, which is our, the biggest program in our college of health and human services. And I also coordinate the gerontology program for our students. Wonderful. Now, likewise, you sit on a number of boards throughout uh, Kalamazoo. Either you sit on them currently or you have in the past, correct? Yes. Okay. And finally, you are project director for, and here's the alphabet again. Um, Director of Michigan SNFO Ethics Training Project. Tell me a bit about that. Okay, I have a current grant from the state of Michigan um, using fines that nursing homes pay to the state uh, when something goes wrong. And so this focuses on compliance and ethics in skilled nursing facilities. So that's what the SNF is or the SNF. That's the fancy word for nursing homes. So oh. I'm working on both online training and in-person training regarding compliance and ethics in Michigan nursing homes. I see. Well, that's interesting because our seniors have proved to be one of the most uh, vulnerable segments of our community. Now, how does this happen when by design, um, these facilities practice um, stay home uh, uh, techniques? All of our, all well, of our seniors are, are they, they're basically quarantined to the, to the facility, correct? Correct. But the people who work in the facilities go home and um, go back and forth. And they actually, many workers, uh, especially the um, direct care workers, may work in more than one facility in order to piece together enough employment. So there's a lot of infection that goes in and out of these facilities. I see. As a result of that, particularly with the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus, are there additional testing policies or um, because it seems like it's just a, a petri dish of infection. How are we ensuring that uh, that our seniors are safe or is that part of the problem that we're experiencing now? 
we have a serious problem right now. And I'm really terrified for those who live in any congregate housing. Um, this includes certainly the older individuals in the nursing homes, but it also includes, um, you know, jails and prisons and uh, mental hospitals, anyone who's grouped together, it's a real risk factor. But in the nursing homes, we also have people who are already older and at risk. So it, it, it is a problem. And uh, we have been caught not fully prepared to take on this problem. So when you say not fully prepared, or I would imagine that's the, the readiness portion of that. When you, when you speak on not really prepared, are you talking about um, PPE, PPE or are you talking about uh, treatment facilities? What, do you, what exactly does that entail? I do think the number one issue is the personal protection equipment. Um, and we just, there are actually no guidelines that tell the nursing homes how much they should have. And so we just do not have, have not had enough. We do not have enough. Hopefully more and more facilities as we're catching up with this pandemic, pandemic do have enough. But so it's one thing to have the supply and then also we need the training. It is very common even before this pandemic to have citations against nursing homes for not following good infection control policies. Um, there's a lot of movement in these places. People have a lot of work to get done. And it's very common to see already um, um, problems with infection control. So we have, we need the equipment and we need the training and we need the oversight to make sure everyone's doing the right thing. I see. Now, typically will, will a facility um, such as a nursing home have enough professionals that, that can withstand the training and, and help our seniors? Well, that's also a problem. For years now, we've had trouble getting enough people to work in nursing homes, especially the, the certified nursing assistants and the direct care workers. So now you're in a situation where there's a facility with a lot of infection and you're not getting paid much for what's very, very hard, what, what is a very, very hard job of providing direct care to people. And a lot of people just not, are not showing up to work because you also don't have the um, protection available. So it's a hard job and we don't have enough people. It doesn't take a lot of skill to be careful about sharing infection, but we, we, I think nursing homes around the entire country are struggling to get enough workers. I, I, can, I can see a lot of that as I watch various broadcasts uh, on television. You know, one of the, um, one of the prevailing thoughts across the country is fear. A lot of our, our professionals are afraid to come in. Mm -hmm. They're afraid for their, their, safe, their, their personal safety, the safety of their family. Uh, they're also afraid because they don't feel as though they have adequate, adequate equipment. And I would imagine that absenteeism is, is growing quite a bit. Here's a yeah. question for you. If I have a loved one in, the, in a nursing home, what should I do? How can I ensure that my loved one is getting the care that uh, certainly we expect them to get? Um, I wish I had a, a great answer to that. Um, I would approach this as a partner with the, with the facility and realize they are struggling to do the best they can. I would offer help. Um, most people, would have trouble bringing the person home because there's a reason, you know, people having someone living in a nursing home is a last resort. So I'm not recommending that because it's just not necessarily the right thing. Pro approximately half of individuals in a nursing home have a pretty significant uh, cognitive impairment or dementia, Alzheimer's disease and things like that. So it's not easy work. So, I would have families ask the facility how they can be help, be helpful, you know? Don't treat them like the enemy because they're trying their best and it's really hard work that they're trying to work on. Um, uh, I would have everyone try to get their own masks and other 
things like that. So maybe at some point they'll be allowed in. I know a lot of visitors have been um, cut off from their loved ones and that's hard as well, but try to be supportive as possible and to help the whole organization. Wow, now, it's, it's interesting because the, the, the difficulties that you speak of are not, are not just exclusive to Kalamazoo. It seems to be happening across the board from state to state, from city to city. Let me ask you, what are some of the things that we can do, um, not, not just currently, but uh, for, future, for future purposes? What, what can we do to, to help and to make these facilities better so that when we have difficult times such as these, we're better prepared and, and our loved ones get better care? Okay. Well, I, there are a couple main avenues. One is to be sure the regulations are strong and the expectations. For example, maybe four or five years ago, um, at the federal level, they had developed stronger standards for infection control. And they officially went into effect in November of 2019. But the current administration decided not to enforce those. So we don't have as many regulations as we potentially could to help things go better when faced with a, a major infection. The other thing is, is just our entire system to have um, nursing home care be a business. And that's what it is for all healthcare in our country. So if you were the administrator of a nursing home and someone said, well, you should be buying thousands of masks, thousands of these, all this personal protection equipment, you can understand they would say, I can't afford to do that. Mm -hmm. And I can't afford to devote an entire space for all that personal protection equipment. So you can understand why they aren't as prepared as they could be. But it's because of the system we have that they are not um, rewarded for being prepared. And now we are all paying the price for that. I see. Now these facilities, uh, it can be somewhat costly. So it seems like we're, we're kind of in a catch 22. No easy way in, no easy way out. Is that, is that kind of what you're feeling? Is that what makes you afraid? Yeah, I, I, I get, well, they certainly are expensive. I, I, my, when I teach classes, it's like staying in a luxury hotel every night. Um, they're very expensive. As you can imagine, it, a lot of people work there and they do have a lot of standards they have to meet. Um, but then once someone is living there, um, there aren't a lot of other options if, if that's not a good place to live. Well, I understand. Now, you know, I looked at information the other day and I saw that as of uh, March 13th, the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid announced new measures um, to keep nursing home residents safe. And the measures include like uh, restrict, restricting all visitors and restricting non-essential volunteers, canceling group activities, um, et cetera. And, and the list goes on. And I thought those were wonderful things to do. Mm -hmm. But you know what worried me and what worries me today is how does that change and how does that impact the residents? Because it seems like they have increased isolation and an uh, increased uh, sense of, of just loneliness. Um, have, you, have you experienced that or do you teach that in your classes? What's the impact of that? Oh, it's huge. Um, one of the things I repeatedly teach my students is that social support is so important in late life. Um, it's good to have friends, it's good to have family, it's good to stay connected, it's really good for our health. And then if you add on to that, we have a lot of those people, again, about half, in living in a nursing home who have some sort of um, cognitive impairment like Alzheimer's disease, and they don't understand. So some of them were lucky, lucky enough to have a child visit every day or several times a week to look out for them and hold their hand. And even if the person didn't know their name, the, let's say it's an older woman, she recognized it was her daughter and that felt good. So now we have a bunch of very stressed staff who are trying their best to provide love and support, but the, the person who lives there doesn't understand what's going on 
and why they don't have the same routine they had before. I see. Now, you know, one of the uh, um, uh, shots that I've seen on television that, that is always very emotional, how family members would come to the, to the window of their loved one being housed in a senior citizen facility, and they'd mm -hmm. wave or sing. Um, is that what we're left with? Is that all we have? Is there a way that we can, that we can touch them, that we can hug them? Uh, what are the, some, of, some of the other things that we can do to comfort our loved ones? Yeah, it's interesting. I was just reading an article, um, a paper that was put together by some gerontological nurses in the state of Connecticut, and they shared that um, it might be getting to the point, especially if someone's close to death, that you we are let we maybe we should start letting people back in to provide comfort in the final days or hours. Um, in a nursing home if someone's dying there. So we might be seeing some changes related to that. Of course, of course you would have to wear a mask and try to keep everybody safe. Um, uh, and now I've totally lost the rest of your question. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's um, quite all right. What's, yeah, what's gonna change is we just need to get that personal protection equipment for everybody um, because, um, Research has shown that most people are testing positive. Yeah, you know, it seems that there are two elephants in the room. One is, is testing equipment. Uh, the other one is PPE. And we don't appear to be making any headway. You talked about uh, deaths earlier as it relates to uh, loved ones in nursing homes. Um, mm -hmm. And I haven't seen, I have seen some information on Kalamazoo nursing homes. Are you seeing that the statistics locally are mirroring those nationally? Um, I haven't been able to compare, but I suspect we will. And I think it's still going to be developing in some of these nursing homes. And at the state level, they've shared that um, within a few days, they're gonna actually start naming the locations. A lot of states have already started to do that. I know Illinois has, I think Florida, California, they actually name the location and how many cases and how many deaths. I don't know how helpful that is necessarily because another research project was recently done in Baltimore by some researchers at Johns Hopkins. And I, I sat on a webinar about that yesterday and they um, tested everybody. And that's a luxury we don't have. And I believe they found that 70% were positive in the nursing home, um, even though they didn't have symptoms. So we just need to assume that the majority of every person in a nursing home is uh, positive for COVID-19. Wow, 70% is huge. You know, another thing that I've, I'm seeing here lately is the disproportionate amount of uh, positive cases in the African-American community versus um, everywhere else. Uh, are we seeing that when you speak of 70% in, in the nursing home, how does that relate to racial boundaries? Are we seeing higher um, positive rates in, in African-American seniors? Oh, absolutely. And in, I, I forget the numbers, but they have focused even in on nursing home residents, it is more likely to um, be fatal for um, African Americans. And certainly, I think it's getting out in the major media that at all ages, this is a much more deadly pandemic for African Americans. Let me ask you, why is that? Uh, I've heard a number of, of, of theories as to why African Americans tend to contract and demonstrate uh, uh, positive symptoms where others do not. Um, I've read a couple of things. One is uh, racism versus terror, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what's your feeling on that? What, what's going on that, that, that makes this virus really invade one uh, segment of the population versus another? Mm -hmm. Well, we had a chance to talk about this before this interview, so you've had a little bit of preview. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot of people will point out that it's African Americans who are the frontline workers, who are essential workers, who have to still go to work and be exposed to the virus. And that is true. Also, we have a long history of health disparities 
uh, for African Americans related to many of the um, diseases that lead to um, negative outcomes with COVID-19, such as high blood pressure and diabetes and um, different forms of heart disease. Um, but what I get frustrated with is I don't hear enough about why uh, African Americans are in these positions to be more susceptible to this disease. And it, it is based in racism and the chronic stress related to racism because chronic stress leads to many negative health outcomes. Um, in sociology and healthcare services, we talk about health disparities and social determinants of health. So if you socially are always on alert, you know, I'm gonna be treated differently because my skin is black, my skin is brown, you know, dark, um, uh, you are going to have chronic stress that then leads to other diseases. So we have a, an entire population um, that lives chronic stress every day. And so they are more susceptible to this um, pandemic. The best research I've seen about this type of logic that I'm presenting here is um, related to infant mortality. And some researchers have done really excellent research it's not a genetic difference that has the African-American babies dying more likely than white babies. It isn't. Um, they control, it's not how your income, it's just that chronic stress related to um, racism. And I want that out in our conversations more with the hope that maybe with acknowledging this impact, we can keep making some sort of progress related to the impact of racism. Absolutely. Now, boy, that, that's something we, we talk about stress, but we never really chronicle the, uh, the, the impact of stress on people, particularly uh, a depressed community, community like the African American community. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you are, you, are you seeing the same types of racisms in, uh, racism in nursing homes? Well, the racism I see in nursing homes is worker versus resident. I, I, I don't have the statistics, but it's my understanding that we're gonna see a few, the population in most nursing homes is pretty white, but you'll see the workers are African-American. And right now they're at, at high degree of risk. So once you get admitted to a nursing home, I don't see that as being, there being a big disparity in the type of care you get. Um, so I don't see that within the nursing home itself in terms of the residents and the type of care they get. Okay, so you're basically speaking of the systemic racism that exists in our society. Right, and by the time you get to be um, 89 years old and you're living in a nursing home with dementia, you have had 89 years of cumulative, we call it cumulative disadvantage or cumulative stress um, that may very well lead to worse outcomes when presented with an infection. Okay. Now, you mentioned that you'd like to uh, have a conversation about it so that we can start to eliminate the problem altogether. Uh, let me ask you, is there, is there a scenario that you've thought of that, that makes that um, easier for it to play out in our daily lives? To talk about racism? Yeah, let's, you know, a chain of events have to happen. We, we can't, we don't have a magic wand that just says tomorrow, no racism, no stress factors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would imagine with all the, the studying you've done that you, you've talked about it in certain circles, how would we, how would you recommend us going about doing it? Just, uh, just continuing to love each other or, or love more or what would you, what would you recommend? Yeah. Well, I, I think there's still so many who don't realize how serious it is and what a horrible impact it has on really everyone's lives, the inequality and discrimination that continues, even though we might say on paper, people are equal and you know, have equal opportunity. It's not the case. I don't know how to get that message out and how to kind of move the needle but um, I hope we can all work together and keep trying. I know we have efforts in Kalamazoo uh, on combating racism, 
I love the bumper sticker from the YWCA. It might have been almost 10 years ago, eight years ago, where it said, racism, think it's over, think again. Yeah, we need to acknowledge that it is not over and it really has a serious impact. Wow, I, I agree. Well, I, I know that there is one way that we can certainly start to move the needle. And that is the more that you continue to be infectious, the more that needle moves. Okay, and, I'll be infectious. Okay, good, <laughs> Clifford. <laughs> I say that knowing firsthand that, that the, they are not just words that you speak, but that's truly how you live your life. Um, and I know that the more people that, that you talk to, that you love, that you teach and that you care about, the more your message becomes a part of their life. I hope so. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, um, I've kept you, I think, for about as long as I can. Okay. Um, I have truly enjoyed our segment. Um, Me too. Time, time has flown. It, it really has. <laughs> uh, but I, again, I'd love to come back so that we can, so that we can do this again. Um, I, I think you've been a wealth of information, and I've got warm fuzzies just speaking with you. Thanks, Clifford, Clifford, and I really appreciate the, the series that you are working on. Um, it's serving an important need. Well, thank you so much. I, I uh, just, it's one of those things that I felt in my heart and I said, you know, this is what we need. Let's support local media. Let's support our communities, our friends, our families, and get it done. Um, if you would, I've got one last thing for you. Okay. Uh, I saw on Facebook where we had a series where uh, we talked about um, Kalamazoo of yesteryear. Do you remember yeah. that? What's your favorite? Of what? The, of, the history of, of Kalamazoo? Well, one of, the, one of the businesses or things that you saw growing up that's no longer there. For me, it was the, the, the small restaurant that was outside of Lord, Lloyd Norks. What is it for you? Oh, you know, I was right outside of Lloyd Norks. Hey, we're both go knights. Um, there used to be like a kitty land and I rode in a little boat. I think that's before you moved to Kalamazoo. So that's way back. I used to drive this little boat in water that went around a circle. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Well, here's what we'll do. I'm going to look to see if I can find that boat for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, listen, that is uh, all the time that I have. I, again, I thank you for being here. But more importantly, I thank you for showing up for Kalamazoo. I look forward to circling back and that you and I can have another conversation on the Kalamazoo Community COVID-19 update. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. The pleasure is mine. Thank you, Jan. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Bye. Bye now. The Kalamazoo Community COVID-19 Update is produced locally through the Public Media Network. Our goal in this and subsequent broadcasts will be to provide you with the most up-to-date local information concerning the health of you and your family throughout this most devastating pandemic. Our community is braced and consistently preparing to handle the medical, emotional, and social needs of our families and friends. Please adhere to the advice of our governmental and community leaders. They are working tirelessly to provide you with information that will make a difference. Our broadcasts are likewise poised to provide you with updates of when and where you can find essential resources. We hope you have received this information with the care and urgency necessary to keep our communities thriving. Please be safe and make wise decisions. Hi, I'm Zach with PMN, and we're going to go over how to practice good information to combat the COVID-19 virus. Something that we must do in these times is practice social distancing. Avoid gatherings of large people, keep your distance, and know that there are safe activities that you can do, such as taking a walk or a family game night. Here are five tips to double check COVID-19 information online. Some stories are too good to be true. False and misleading stories spread because people share them. Not all research is created equal. Verify images with reverse image search. Verify videos with thumbnails and invid. Use geolocation to determine where a photo or video was taken. Help is also available. For emotional support, call 269-381-4357 for the local crisis hotline or call 
800-273-8255 for the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. More information can be found on our website at publicmedianet.org.